What has always been one of the big questions in the field is, so what's the deal with rough and tumble play? What's play about? Because you see it in endless species out there. A lot of studies show that during periods of famine, for example, one of the last behaviors that disappears from kids is play. It is really, really hardwired in there. So when you see aggressive play, is this truly aggression? Or is this practicing the building blocks for the real stuff that will come later on? What a lot of the primate studies suggest is it's not practice. It's not play. It's already establishing some of the asymmetries that will be there later in life. OK, so all sorts of ways in which aggression can pop up in other species in unexpected realms in which cooperation, all sorts of things like that. What are some of the unique human ones? Nonetheless, amid all those similarities, we do things that are completely unprecedented. We are perfectly capable of being as violent as a chimp when it comes to cudgeling somebody over the head, but we're the only species that could be violent by doing nothing more physically taxing than pulling a trigger, or looking the other way, or releasing a bomb from 30,000 feet up in the air, or being passive aggressive, or damning with faint praise. And we're suddenly doing all sorts of much more subtle things with aggression. Here's three examples of human aggression that I've heard about which shows just how complex of a phenomenon this could be. First one. This was the child of a friend of mine when she was about five years old, and she was in kindergarten or pre-K or something, and there was another kid there that she was not getting along with. And this was around Easter, and they were painting Easter eggs, and some tussle came up between them, and my friend's daughter broke the other kid's Easter egg. Tears, hysteria, teachers swooping in to say, you're not a bad child, but you've done a bad thing, and you can't do stuff like that, and you are going to paint a new Easter egg to give to her to make up for the one that she broke. So my friend's kid proceeds to go to the corner with this new egg and some paint brushes. And what becomes apparent after a while is she's sort of like looking over her shoulder and working away on something here and glowering back at everybody. And finally, she comes up to the other kid and says, here's your stupid Easter egg, happy Easter, and gives her an egg that she's painted completely black. <laughs> Okay, what's with the aggression here? Easter eggs, pastel colors, bunny rabbits, all that sort of thing. Easter eggs are not supposed to be one solid color and certainly not jet black. That's not what, what was she doing here? She was cooperating with the letter of the law while doing as much violence to the spirit of the law as possible. What she was saying was, she's making me paint this egg for you and I don't like you one bit more than 30 minutes ago. And showing that the other kid fully understood what this human bit of passive aggression was about, she burst into tears as soon as she saw the egg. Next example of the subtlety of human aggression. And this one involved um, my wife. OK. <laughs> so this was occasion we were like driving around somewhere in a minivan with our kids, and some total jerk like cut us off. And you know, it could have killed us and our kids. And, uh, uh, and my wife was driving, and we sort of get past what should logically have been about five seconds of cursing the person. And she suddenly says, I'm going after this guy. <laughs> and she proceeds to trail the guy and trails him for about two miles while I'm sitting there getting increasingly distressed and panicked. And eventually, he like, realizes he's being followed now and is taking sort of evasive maneuvers. And eventually, we get him on the st street where there's a red light there, where there's a car in front of him. And then we're behind him, so it's not like he could, in a panic, go through the red light there because he's trapped there. And we happen to know this was a very long red light. While well, I've been sitting there for the last five minutes saying, um, do you think this is really a good, and then I just go around another corner tracking him down. So we're sitting there, and suddenly my wife says, I'm going over there. And she grabs something from between the seats and storms out while I say, um, do you really think that's a good? And she's gone. So I like get out and I run over there and I see the windows down in the car and she's yelling at the guy and she says, anybody who could do something like that needs this. And she flings something at him. So she comes back to the car at that point and the light has changed and this guy like 
like slinks off into, if it is possible for a car to look sheepish, moving like four miles an hour, heads off into the sunset down this dark little block there. So sitting there and like she's milking this for all it's worth in terms of what did you put in there? And she looks totally delighted with herself. And she's like euphoric. And I said, well, what, what did you say to him? You said, what was that? And she said, anyone who could do anything this mean needs one of these. And I said, what did you do then? And she said, I threw a lollipop at him. <laughs> I said, whoa, you killer, you. you I was so proud of her. My God, the violence intrinsic in that. No other species would know what was that going on there in terms of the intrinsic passive aggression and complaint, all of that. We're the only ones who could come up with something like that. Third example. Every day out in Nevada, in a town there, there are men who get up to go off to work and they kiss the family goodbye and they've got to get reminded that to pick up the dry cleaning and they get in the car and they're a little bit late and there's a lot of traffic and they get all stressed with the traffic jam but they get there to work on time and they're a little bit relaxed there and they finally can come in and they sit down in a chair in what is a model of the cockpit of a fighter plane and what they do is control drone airplanes on the other side of the planet in Iraq and they spend the day sitting there at their work shift controlling planes that release bombs and missiles and destroy people 12,000 miles away. So they spend the entire day sitting there in this air-conditioned room in Nevis Air Force Base in uh, just outside Las Vegas, and they spend the day doing that, and at the end of the day, they pick up and they tell everyone they'll see them tomorrow, and they go pick up the dry cleaning, and they go to their little daughter's ballet concert, and afterward they hug her and can't believe they could love somebody this much, and then the next morning they go back to spending their day killing people on the other side of the planet. There's not a whole lot of species out there who could do that either. So by the time you're getting to us, we have ways of being awful to other members of our species that are simply unmatched, and we have ways of being empathic as well as we begin to wrestle here with the neurobiology and the endocrinology and finally walking our way back towards the left, we are going to have this huge problem of the context of aggression and this even huger problem of just how complex aggression and empathy are when you leave it to humans. Examples at the empathy end, human versions of it, the things we are able to reconcile, we are a species who has invented truth and reconciliation commissions in South Africa, in the Balkans, in Rwanda, where people face the person who did that to them, the person who destroyed their life, destroyed their family, and going through what is by now a fairly well worked out process that all sorts of people have studied. And in some of those cases, there is reconciliation. There is even forgiveness. How could this possibly happen? We have a world where we try to have individuals foster peace through the most unlikely of rationales. I will, net, I will let no man spoil my soul by causing me to hate him. That is a psychology that is unprecedented. We have the world of people like this Catholic nun, Sister Helen Prejean, who has spent her entire career ministering to the needs of men on death row in a maximum security prison in Louisiana. She was the person who was featured in the movie way back when, Dead Man Walking. And what she spent a lot of her time doing is having incredulous people, often the relatives of the victims of these murderers, come up and say, how can you do this? How could you spend your life devoted to people like these? And she comes up with an answer that is so definedly human that no other species could come near, how, no matter how much they groom victims. Her answer always is, the less forgivable the act, the more it must be forgiven. The less lovable the person, the more they must be loved. And suddenly, we're in a world that the more something cannot be, the more it must be, as a moral sort of act to do, 
whoa, nobody out there in the animal kingdom is going to have a clue what we're up to. This is very complex terrain we are going to deal with here as we now shift over to the biology of it.